So we're going to move on today and look at diffraction and interference of light. We'll be looking at um, the qualitative aspect of diffraction. So diffraction is something that you learned about in Physics 20. You learned very briefly about it. And given the whole shutdown of the school last year, the depth with which it was gone into by your teacher uh, may have been quite shallow or quite deep, depending on your teacher. It's important at this level, and if you don't remember what diffraction is, that's fine. <laughs> that's normal. But once we do remind ourselves what diffraction is, you need to be able to explain the conditions necessary for waves, in particular EMR, to diffract. Then we're going to be looking at two different types of interference. One is called constructive interference and one is called destructive interference. These are things that waves undergo and in fact, put this up here so I can keep that highlight that I'm going to add. In fact, diffraction and interference, these are things that only waves do. And that's really important for you to remember as we progress through this course from here on in. Um, Particles never diffract, particles never interfere. Yeah, that's the thing to remember right now. Then we're going to be using Young's double slit formulas to solve problems involving these two types of interference. So when waves meet, they have the ability to interfere. And they can interfere by either building up wave energy, and that's called constructive in, uh, interference, or they can meet by canceling wave energy depending on how they meet. And that's called destructive. So to begin with, what diffraction and interference are the two main things that only waves do? So if you see something in the universe and it's an evidence or an example of diffraction and interference, then as far as we're concerned right now, you're looking at waves. Only waves diffract and only waves interfere. Now, what is diffraction? Diffraction of a wave happens when a wave goes through an opening and the wave spreads out. Now, the fact that you can hear me is because of sound waves. There's energy leaving my mouth through my vocal cords and it's traveling out in the room. And if diffraction of sound waves didn't happen, then when I faced this direction and spoke in this direction, the sound waves would only travel in this direction and you wouldn't be able to hear me. And if sound waves didn't diffract, not only would I have to face you for you to hear me, you'd have to turn your ear so the sound wave went straight into your ear. So what's happening when the sound waves leave my mouth is they spread out. And I think it's important you understand when that wave energy, which is packed together in this tiny little area here, leaves my mouth and spreads out, the wave energy gets diluted. Okay? And I think we know this from experience. If you're standing here, you hear me quite loudly. But if you're standing over here, you don't hear me as loudly. You might be just as close. Not all of the wave energy makes it over on that side. So when the waves leave and go through that opening on the other side, they spread out. These red lines, by the way, are called wave rays. And the bluish lines are called wave fronts. And if we were doing this with a tank of water, and I'm looking down on a tank of water, and I actually want to create these parallel ripples on the left, then I would have to take some straight object and dip it in and out of the water from above. So what you're actually looking at there are the peaks of the waves. Those blue lines are actually the top of the wave. In other words, I'll show you this diagram. The lines in my diagram and in the diagram on your handout that are straight and then circular on the other side represent the crest of a water wave. So in between the two crests, there are troughs as well. And that will be important for later. Um, so the diagram shows a plane wave front. That's another way of saying ripples. Incident on an opening in a ripple tank. When, what does this mean? What, what, what do I mean when I say the wave spreads out? What I mean is this, that if 
You're sitting out here someplace. You've got uh, an air mattress that's an inflatable air mattress. You're sitting there, you're drinking your pina colada, reading your book, enjoying the sunshine. And I create a whole bunch of wave energy on the left-hand side, even though you might be sitting over here on an inflatable device, your inflatable device will still be jostled up and down. There will be wave energy that doesn't go straight through the opening, it spreads out. But if you are over here, you will be jostled up and down even more. And this is what I was talking about a couple of minutes ago. The wave energy that makes it through, this tiny amount of wave energy that makes it through, gets spread out everywhere. So if you were to look at an energy diagram, so I've got now the wave front coming from the top, it goes through the opening and it spreads out. What you would discover is that the energy would look like this on a graph. And again, I'm, I'm showing this to you as a visual because later on it will be important. Not just later on in this lesson, but later on in this unit. So if you are over in this region, will somebody on top of the water, on the surface of the water, be jostled up and down? Yes, but with not as much energy as they would be jostled up and down here. Is that clear? You understand what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Particles, needless to say, do not do that. If I had, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, a paintball gun, and I'm pointing the paintball gun downward through the opening, and I'm firing these solid particles, they are simply going to all land in the basic position shown here. So it doesn't matter how many I fire. What I end up with is not a spreading out of energy. I end up with a lump of energy in one place. So the fact that waves do this tell us they're waves. They're not particles. Uh, I took these from, oh man, I'll maybe try to find some clearer pictures, some better pictures. I took this from Google Earth when Google Earth was brand new. I went looking around the shorelines for evidence of water waves diffracting. And here you've got the opening between two coral reefs or islands. I can't judge the scale on this. It looks like a road. And you get this kind of rippling that's curving there. Here's a very good example. This is a wave break on a beach. So over here is a beach, and this is the area just below the, where I wrote beach. That's the area where people would frolic in the water and have fun. And you want to, when you go to the beach, still experience the water splashing around. But if this wave break weren't here, the wave energy contained in all of this water on the bottom of this photo would play havoc with, every, with everybody on the beach. It would be too much. It wouldn't be fun. It would be you'd be trying to survive. So I, I say that because some people say, well, why don't they just build a solid wall? Well, I think one of the reasons if you build a solid wall, it's going to end up breaking because of all of the wave energy. You need a release for some of that wave energy. But the other reason is you want to have some waves occurring above that. There's a rule for diffraction, and I don't expect anybody to remember this. I, I do remember teaching it to my physics 20s last year, that diffraction doesn't always happen. In order for diffraction to happen, this is a very specific rule that you need to know. The size of the opening has to be smaller, roughly, smaller than the wavelength. The opening has to be about the same size or smaller than the wavelength. If the opening is too big, no diffraction occurs, or very little diffraction occurs. And I can tell I should have either made a bigger box for you to write in or told you that there's going to be a second thing to write. And I'm sorry for that if you filled it up. This next part is pretty slippery in the brain. 
the smaller the opening is compared to the wavelength, the more diffraction occurs. So the opening's got to be the same size as the wavelength or smaller. And if it's even smaller, the smaller it is compared to the wavelength, the more the diffraction occurs. And I will explain to you what that means in just a minute. How many of you, by a show of hands or a nod of the head, remember something about diffraction from Physics 20? It's, yeah, I, it's like most of the stuff from last year, it's kind of a big, big haze. Okay, so as an illustration here, and, and you don't need to write this down. You can always watch the video, and I'll, I'll post the link to this video on our Google Classroom. If I had three different wavelengths, and it's important for you to remember that red light, I'm just using light as an example, even though I'm talking about water waves, that red light has a longer wavelength than green light, and green light has a longer wavelength than violet light. But if I were to send these three waves through these tiny openings, as long as, and it says at the top, the opening is smaller than all of the wavelengths, that means that each of these three waves will spread out on the other side of the opening. But when the first wave with a relatively small wavelength goes through the opening, it will diffract because the opening is smaller than the wavelength. When the second wave goes through that same opening, it will diffract, but it will diffract more because the size of the opening is smaller than the wavelength by a greater amount. And when red light goes through, well, I, I'm talking about light here. I'm kind of jumping the gun, but when the wavelength that's very long, goes through a very tiny opening, there will be the most diffraction. Okay. Another comparison that we could make, instead of having three different wavelengths going through the same opening, we could have the same wave going through three different openings. And if I told you that this wave with a particular wavelength goes through that top opening and it diffracts, you should be able to tell me whether that same wave going through a smaller opening will diffract more or less. And it will diffract more because the opening is smaller in relation to the wavelength. And finally, you'd get the most diffraction with the third case because the opening is in relation to the wavelength as small as possible. There's another illustration I can give you here and the colors, I think I have colors on here. They don't mean anything. But this is that energy diagram that I showed you earlier where you have a distribution of energy and the most wave energy happens directly across from the opening. So if we go back to this diagram, actually, you know what? You can even see it. Can you see that there's more wave energy along this path than there is along that path. You can see the ripple is more severe, right? The water is being churned up and jostled around a lot more directly across from the opening. So you get a lot of energy there. If you, I want to talk more about this and then we'll get back to that diagram. If you were in a boat, this is a boat, there's the motor, a sailboat, and you're moving in that direction. I don't know what that is you're in that boat moving in that direction at a constant speed, your boat will be jostled up and down. And as you move to the right, it will be jostled up and down more and more. More energy is going to be put into that jostling and then it will start to calm down again. So that's a large opening still smaller than the wavelength. If you went with a medium size opening, and again, the colors don't mean anything, you'd get more diffraction. And intuitively, most people think that graph should be taller if there's more diffraction. But diffraction is the spreading out of the energy, the dilution of the energy. Dilution means you're, you're watering it down, so to speak. And if you had a very, very tiny opening, 
you would have lots of diffraction. That would mean you still get the most energy directly across from the opening, but you don't get as much directly across because more of it has been spread out to the sides. And these graphs are all things that you might see on an exam as part of a question. So now let's talk about interference. Waves can also interfere. What does that mean? Well, when waves meet, if they're traveling in not the same direction, maybe they're traveling in opposing directions, they have the ability to overlap and pass through each other. And clearly particles cannot do that, right? While the waves are on top of each other, we have this thing called the principle of superposition. And all it means is that whatever the one wave looks like on its own and the other wave looks like on its own, then they overlap and they exist at the same point at the same time and they produce a third wave temporarily that's the result of those two waves being in the same position. It just means the two waves are existing at the same place at the same time and they interfere with each other. So I'm gonna just, I don't want you to see that whole thing just yet. So there's one type of wave interference that results when waves meet and the phrase is in phase. And all this means is that at that point in time, the two waves are meeting crest to crest. So the, the peak of water wave and the peak of a water wave are in the same place at the same time. or trough to trough. The, the idea here is if one of the waves at that point in space is pushing the water to its highest point and the second wave is also pushing water to its highest point, then the two waves kind of join forces and push the water up to an even higher point. If they're meeting trough to trough, the trough is the bottom part of a, say a water wave, then at that point in space, each of those waves is trying to push the water down as much as possible. There's the most wave energy there, and they're both acting in the same direction. So the wave energy adds up. Whenever you've got waves that are interfering because they meet in phase, the wave energy adds up. And this is called constructive interference. I mean, the word constructive has a lot of meanings, but when you think of it in terms of, say, the word construction, when you look at construction, which is a type of variation of the word constructive, construction means to build something. The wave energy gets added up. So that's what we call in phase. Out of phase, well, I think you could probably figure this out. If two waves meet out of phase, what has to happen is that the crest of one wave has to meet the trough of another wave. When they're meeting in phase, I can say crest to crest or trough to trough. When they're meeting out of phase, I guess I could say crest to trough or trough to crest. There's really no difference. So what's happening here is one of the waves, even though they're on top of each other, and when they're on top of each other, you can't see the waves separately. One of the waves is attempting to push the water, say, up, while the other wave is attempting to push the water down. And because pushes are forces, those two forces add by canceling each other. So the wave energy uh, diminishes, it decreases. It doesn't add up. It gets smaller. And this is called destructive interference. We start to get into something that's very abstract here because I, I'm going to show you a couple of very grainy, very old video clips. You know, it's amazing how we've got all this technology now and the internet and all these computer devices, but nobody seems to want to film these things in real life. They'll show you animations and stuff. And I've tried to reproduce this uh, effect and it just doesn't come across the same. First of all, before we look at those videos, if these two waves were meeting in phase, we're not going to worry about how they got in this place. 
maybe the red wave is on its way left to right and the green wave is moving right to left. I don't know. Maybe they're both moving in the same direction for some reason and one caught up with the other one. But when they are in this position, then you are going to get this new wave being created. And be clear here, it isn't that you'll see three waves, you will see the blue wave. The colors don't mean anything. If you were to take a look at these two waves, they're meeting out of phase. And what would happen when you combine them is you would get less wave energy. I'm not sure why the blue line is faded out like that. But you would get less wave energy. Do you see that the green wave is winning the battle here? The red wave is winning the battle here? Okay, <laughs> sorry. You see that the red wave is, is overcoming the green wave? Okay, so now let's take a look at some videos. And again, these are very old. I've used them for close to 30 years now. If it opens, I hope it opens. Got our loop, good. So I'm going to let you watch this just for a couple of run-throughs. And what I would tell you is we have these two waves. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. Come on. So they're passing through each other. Now, when you look at that, I hope most of you see that they bounce off of each other. Yes? But they don't. They go through each other. And take a very close look at the height of the wave coming in from the right compared to the height of the wave coming in from the left. Just look at the height of those two waves. I think it's clear the wave on the right that's coming from the right and moving left is taller than the wave on the left that's moving right. Would you agree? Not by a lot, but by a little. And I think this was a mistake on whoever created this and filmed it, but I'm glad they did make the mistake. Because if you take a look now at the waves after they have interacted, it's now the wave on the left that's taller than the wave on the right. These waves, this is bizarre. They've gone through each other somehow and remembered that the one traveling to the left has to have more wave energy which is a really bizarre thing. I, I hope you can appreciate too that there has been some wave energy lost. If you were to take a look at the total wave energy here, just by the amplitude of the waves, and look at the total wave energy here, there's less wave energy. I also want you to notice that if you were to take these two wave energies right here, say just measure the amplitude of each one, and then compare those two to the amplitude when they're on top of each other, it's greater when they're on top of each other. So the energy has been added up. This is called constructive interference. This video clearly has two different amplitudes. No, it's the same one. Sorry, guys, I don't know why it's not opening that file. There we go. Okay, clearly two different amplitudes. And this one is more obvious that they're going through each other. But again, you get that blip right in the middle where they have added up their wave energy, which is a measure of the amplitude. And again, the taller wave, which started on the right, goes through the smaller wave while the smaller wave goes through the larger wave. I think that's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, that they actually do go through each other. If we take a look now at 
a video that somebody made of two waves on a slinky meeting out of phase. Again, you can see the top wave, the wave coming from the right, continues to the left, and the wave coming from the left afterwards continues to move in its original direction. By the way, when they're on top of each other, it's a bit of a mess, but I think I nailed it. This is when they're right on top of each other. And the height of that wave is less than the height of the wave that started on the right. Because the one that started on the left removed some of the wave energy temporarily. Is this making sense to you? OK. All right. So it turns out that if you can get diffraction occurring by having waves go through two openings, you get something called an interference pattern. If I have a water wave traveling upwards on this diagram and enters through this opening, we know it spreads out. And this is the diagram that's at the top of your page. Right? It's turned in a different way, but that's what's going on. And if we had a wave going through the other opening at the same time, it spreads out as well. And remember that these circular lines are ripples. So there are going to be places here where constructive interference occurs because the crest of one of the waves is meeting with the crest of another. I would like you, just with a pencil or a pen, to mark a place on this diagram where constructive interference occurs. Any place at all. And there are dozens of places. You're looking for any place where the crest of a wave from the first opening and a crest of the wave from the second opening are meeting at that point in time. This is just a snapshot in time. So, you know, I would say there's one here. Do you agree? And I would say there's one here, and there's one here, and here, and here, and here. I want you to notice those dots don't form a straight line, although we're going to treat them as if they did. There is also a point of constructive interference here. And the basic reason, everyone, that there is a point of constructive interference here is because that is where the trough of one wave and the trough of a second wave are meeting. The trough of the wave from the opening on the left is halfway between those two crests. This is a confusing diagram. The trough of the opening from the ripple on the right, or the wave on the right, is between those two crests. So it's meeting trough to trough there. I have never found an easy way to explain this, so you'll just have to accept it. Everywhere along this line, will be constructive interference. It doesn't have to be right at a crest meeting a crest or a trough meeting a trough. Basically, because those two waves have the same shape and wavelength at that point, any point on that line, they're both trying to accomplish the same thing. They're both pushing the water in the same direction at the same time, whether it's pushing it up or down. I'm not saying that there's the same amount of wave energy everywhere along here, but I'm saying everywhere along there will be waves being added up. And we will also get, incidentally, what we're doing is answering this question at the bottom. We will also get constructive interference along this line. And constructive interference along this line. and along this line. And I guess along this line. 
So what, what does this mean? When I talked about the boat going across that wave front that was circular, I want to go back to that for a second. When I talked about the boat moving from here this way. What happened was the boat was being sloshed along because of the wave, and as it got closer to this midline, as it got closer to that point, it went up and down more violently. And then it drowned out and, and reduced back to nothing. So the wave energy went up to a max and then down. That's what was happening when you had a single opening that had diffraction. What's happening here? Is as the boat, and I'm going to just cut off some of my diagram here. I'm going to cut it off even more. As the boat travels from here in this direction, it's going to go through calm spots where there's no interference, or rather where there's destructive. And then it's going to be jostled up and down a lot here. It's going to die out. It's going to be jostled up and down a lot here. And it's going to be jostled up and down here more than it was here. And then it's going to go through a calm spot, jostle up and down even more, a calm spot, jostle down even more, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can even put in here. And I don't expect you to put that on your diagram. It's not possible for you to do that. We can even put in here points of destructive interference. This point, this point, this point, this point. These are all points where crests are meeting troughs. So halfway between the lines of construction you get lines of destruction. Which means, and we're talking about water waves still, which means that as you move across this diagram from here to the other side, you go through lots of wave energy here, no wave energy here, more wave energy here, no wave energy here, lots of wave energy here, none, lots, none, lots. I hope you appreciate that those dots I drew up top, top in red, the one across from the two openings is where the most wave energy is going to be. And as you go further and further away, it decreases. So what this diagram looks like in terms of energy, if you're interested, is something like that, where you get the most energy at a very specific location directly across from the openings. Then you have two dead zones on both sides of that. And then beside that, you have two hot spots. And then you have dead zones and hot spots, et cetera. So before we take this over to the realm of light, does anybody have any questions you'd like me to explain here or anything you're wondering about this so far? So let's take the jump into light then, because I have the equivalent of two openings here. And we're just about ready to say that light does this. So we'll talk in detail tomorrow and the next day about what these things are I'm going to shine the light through. But I'm basically shining the, the light, this big blob of light. And, I, and I'm doing this to answer your question. Because quite frankly, I can't answer your question in the context of a water wave. It's very difficult for me to say what's going to happen to that. 
I almost have to think of light or go to a formula, and we're about to learn the formulas. So what I'm talking about here is a big blob of light, and it's going to be going through two openings. It, it's more complicated than that, but if light consisted of particles, then what we would see over here on a screen would be two dots of light. It would be like me finding a, a wall someplace that's made of concrete with two openings in it, and I randomly start throwing rocks at the wall. And then I do this all day because I don't know why. I go to the other side of the wall and I look at the rocks, I'm going to see two piles. So when I do this, when I shine this red light through these openings, this is green light actually, uh, I don't get two dots. I get lots of dots. And I don't really like that one. I'm going to go here instead. Uh, let's go here. And you notice that uh, I get three dots for sure. I'm going to go with uh, red. We'll explain the details of this later. Yeah, I'll go red here. There's a good one. I hope you can see that the dot that's right above the row that Farhan is sitting in, that's brighter than the dots on the other sides. It's more well-defined. And as we go further and further from that center point, um, they get dimmer. Okay. I'm going to go back to green and use this one. You get my drift? So right now, I am shining it through an opening that I would describe as being medium in nature. If I move, if I increase the size of the opening, sorry, decrease the size of the opening, they get even further apart. So what I can say to you is if the, and I'm talking about the opening here, but if I were to move them further apart, the ripples would get further apart as well, so the lines would get further apart. It, it's very, one of the things we're going to be struggling with here very shortly is we really, you know what, we really don't care about the size of the opening. We care about the distance between the openings, which is what you're talking about. So it isn't that the opening is smaller or bigger. It's that they're closer or further apart. So I'll go with violet because we don't often get a chance to see violet light in action. Uh, and I'm going to kill some of the lights because the violet light is kind of a dull color. So I am shining right now the violet light through an incredibly tiny opening. And if I were to estimate if I were to estimate I would say that from the left hand dot past the central bright dot to the right hand dot is about, boy, did I have enough coffee today or what? Is about three quarters to 80% of the width of that tile. I'm just, I could have put a meter stick up there. And now I'm going to go, that was a very tiny opening. Now I'm going to go to, not a very tiny opening, that was, the distance between the openings is quite small. Now I'm going to move them further apart. I just want to make sure I got that right. Does that say 100? I can't read that. Can't read it. So I might have had it backwards. I, I'm going to use a formula in the end anyway. Uh, so that's 600 lines per meter. So yeah, I had it backwards. These are the openings are very close together these the openings are closer together and you can see the dots are closer together i wouldn't we're going to do a lot of these demonstrations tomorrow in preparation for your lab that you're going to do i wouldn't worry too much about trying to figure out from here on in evan what's going on in terms of this diagram and the relationship between how far apart the lines are or what the distance is between the openings or any of that. I would simply worry about the formulas once we're gonna, once we learn them in a few minutes. Is that okay? Okay. 
By the way, just a general observation here. This is violet light with a very tiny wavelength. And this is a tricky question. When I shine the violet light through, I'll use the same window that I had before, this. You can get an idea of how close the dots are together. And they're dots, by the way, because the laser light is a dot. So what we're getting is that interference pattern where it's going up and down and up and down. I'm going to switch to red light. Should the red light, should those dots be closer together or further apart than they were for violet? And I, while you're going to think of an answer, I have to run this through my head. I have the answer. What do you think, Parhan? Right. The, clearly, this openings in this window are smaller than the wavelength of any of these lasers. But the size of the openings here, this has nothing to do with how far apart they are, the size of the openings here is smaller compared to red than it is compared to violet. And you can see, I mean, look at the big difference. Look how far apart those first three dots are, the center one and the one on the left and the right. And then when I go to violet in the same window, they're very close. Green should be somewhere in between. Okay. And you know what? Maybe I'm going to tell you something that's a bit of a lie here. It's, it's not a bit of a lie. It's a lie. Okay. This is an opening of a particular size. I'm lying to you already, okay? But this is an opening of a particular size. This, these openings are smaller. So just think of them as being smaller openings, which means it diffracts more. So the lie is I'm talking about the size of the openings, but Evan, your original question is, what about the distance between them? If I make the distance smaller, the effects of the diffraction get greater. Just like if I make the openings smaller. Okay, so it turns out light does this. I've already explained this. When light passes through tiny openings, it doesn't behave like ping pong balls or golf balls or marbles. The light doesn't land in two piles. The light lands in a lot of different piles. All of the piles are represented by this. So what you have is a source of light here. A source of light above that makes it through these two openings and the light interferes to produce this pattern. What we're seeing on the ceiling is you're seeing a big blob of light and then a smaller blob and an even smaller and an even smaller and an even smaller. Okay. So the fact of the matter is light does diffract and interfere. The openings need to be very tiny. So I want you to just look at anything in the room. You could look at me, you could look at the screen, you could look at the water bottle. It's nice and clear, right? You can see things, they're focused. If you're in Physics 30 and you're starting to get bored and you're kind of, your eyes are starting to droop, you notice that what you're seeing is blurry. Like if you squint your eyes, things get blurry. If you squint your eyes and things get clearer, then make an eye appointment, okay? You need glasses. But when you squint, things get blurry. And the reason for that is your eyelashes start to get very close to each other and you're creating little tiny openings that the light is traveling through to your eyeball. But when they go through those tiny openings, they spread out and the light gets blurry. Okay. That's evidence of light diffracting. So we don't normally notice this because the wavelength of the light is so small and Again, the opening has to be smaller than the wavelength. What are we talking about here? We're talking about 700 nanometers for red light. You need openings really, really tiny. So you don't normally see this. Thomas Young, I'm, I've already shown this all to you. So Thomas Young came up with a way, this is like two, 300 years ago, of creating two very, very tiny openings. They were actually slits by using razor blades. And he took two razor blades and he glued them together. 
Now, if you were to look at the edge of a razor blade, just like the edge of a knife, it has a certain shape to it. This is the shape over here that the razor blades have. And what Thomas Young did was he took a piece of glass, held it over a candle flame to get a black soot on it, and then took the two razor blades and scratched them across the soot, leaving two very, very tiny lines that are very close to each other. And if light is a particle, when you shine light through those two slits, you should just see two lines of light. But he didn't. He saw what we've been looking at in the lab on the ceiling. And I want to impress on you, now we're going to be talking about light, that when I shine the, the light, the red laser through this window, I'm going to, I need to go to a different one. There we go. See all those dots of light? You need to appreciate that each of those dots of light is connected to a beam of light that leaves this window and goes to the ceiling. If I fogged up the room, and it's a pain to do it, so I'm not going to, you would notice that what you're looking at on the board right now is what you would see here. And I can show that to you because if I put my hand here, I block it. So the light is over here as well. Right? It's not just, it doesn't just disappear as it leaves that window and then ends up appearing on the ceiling. There are actual beams of light. And Thomas Young worked out the mathematics of this, and you're going to start adding some things to this diagram. So on the diagram, you have what's called a monochromatic light source, a laser, a light source where you have one specific wavelength. These red lines of light that you're looking at are those lines that we put on the diagram on the front page. I better pick up the pace here, otherwise we won't get done. That's okay, we've got three days to work on this stuff. Um, this is the double slit. And the one that I'm using in the class here just to demonstrate this is not something I've made with a candle flame or anything. It's something manufactured for this purpose. It's called a diffraction grating, but we'll talk about them tomorrow. And then on the right-hand side, we have all of these points, which I call bright spots. Now, the only reason I'm calling them spots is because typically when we do this in a physics lab, we're using a laser, and a laser has a spot of light. I hope it's not lost on you that in the diagram, the line of light that hits directly across from the double slit is the thickest line of light, which means that spot will be the brightest. All of these bright spots are called antinodes. I know that seems um, opposite to what it should be, because the word anti seems to assume nothing. There's a reason for that that I don't want to get into right now, because I just realized we're running a little short of time here. So a bright spot is an anti-node. In between the bright spots, you have dark spots. And the dark spots, I, I don't know why we call them dark spots. It, they're, they're places where there's no light. There's no spot there. There's just nothing there what we call them a dark spot. And those are called nodes. And I suppose you could remember that dark spots are nodes because there is no light there. Node, no. And Thomas Young came up with some formulas. And these are the two formulas. There's a lot of variables here, so we're going to have to figure out what they all mean. But it's not that difficult. There's two formulas, lambda equals xd over nl, and lambda equals d sine theta over n. So what are all these variables? Well, clearly, lambda is the wavelength of the light. Okay? You need to know that. Lambda is the wavelength, whatever wavelength you use. And he developed these formulas just through geometry, and they work. 
Lambda is the wavelength. L is the distance between the double slit and the screen. So let's just talk about that for a second. If I shine this light through this double slit, and I measured a straight line distance from the center of this slide or window that the light is originating from to the center dot up there, then that would be L. L is how far away from the double slit to the screen. What D is, I'll show you what D is. I don't know if you can tell on my diagram. You see there's two little notches here? D is the distance between those two. So D is not the size of the opening. As we kind of talked about this a little earlier. What D is, is how far apart the openings are. Now, X and N go together. So what X is is the distance from the bright central antinode, which is sometimes called, bless you, which is sometimes called the central maximum. X is the distance from there to whatever part of the image you're talking about. So X can be the distance from the center to the N equals 2 maximum. X can be the distance from the center to the second dark spot. X can be whatever you want it to be. It's a distance from the center to that point of interest. What N tells you is which point of interest you care about. If you measure, as I have in this diagram, X to be from the center to the second bright spot, then you have to use N equals 2. If I said that we were going to use the third node, well, here's the first node where there's no light. Here's the second node where there's no light. Here's the third node. Here would be a bright spot that's n equals 3. If we use the third node, you would have to use n equals 2.5. So what do you use for n? It depends on what you used for x. Theta is the angle between the straight perpendicular distance to the screen and the line of light you're talking about. And then we have this added little feature that the formula on the left is only good if the angle is less than about 10 degrees. And then the next couple days we'll learn why that's the case in more and more detail. But if the angle is 40 degrees, you are not allowed to use this formula. You have to use the formula with theta in it. I, I don't want to explain why we even have a formula that doesn't work all the time, but I will eventually. So let's take a look at some examples now. So we have monochromatic light. Well, that's good because then we have one wavelength. If I shone two different colors of light through the same set of double openings, then I would see a whole bunch of different things go on. Okay. Um, you're told that the slit separation, which is the distance between the openings, is 0 0.0003 meters. And this is often called Young's double slit experiment because he didn't have little holes. He had slits that the light would go through. So on his screen, he wouldn't see dots of light. He would see lines of light. Um, the distance, or the angle, rather, that the spot is located at is 0 0.08 degrees. And it is the n equals 1 antinode. And it says, what is the wavelength of the light? Like, think about what this is saying. This is saying you shine the light through the double opening, and you discover that there's a bright spot directly across from it, and then those two spots that are on both sides are angled like 0.08 degrees. Very, very tiny angle. So clearly, the diffraction gratings, well, the openings I'm using here are not the same type of opening that we have in this question. I will tell you right now, Farhan, can you take 1 divided by, oh, I can do that, 0.01, 
this is about point zero 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 one millimeters very 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 small d so there's lots of diffraction all we're going to do to find the wavelength of the light here is go lambda equals d sine theta over n and you're going to put the numbers in for me make sure that you use degrees By the way, Evan, when you talked about, well, what if the openings are further apart? Uh, you can see that D and theta are inversely proportional here. So if D gets bigger, theta gets smaller. There's an inverse relationship there. Um, Sienna, can you tell me what you got? 4.2 times 10 to the negative 7. 4.2 times 10 to the negative 7. Let me just briefly, perfect, thank you. Let me just briefly say I could ask you this on an exam, but instead of asking you for the wavelength, I could just say the color of the light used in the experiment is blue, green, red, yellow. And you'd have to know it's blue because that's the short end of the visible light spectrum. So you, you have to know these things. Any questions with example one? All right, let's try number two. Student is measuring the wavelength of light emitted by krypton gas. She directs the light through two slits that are separated by that distance. That means that D equals... We have to work in standard units. I didn't say that, but we should work in standard units. Um, the interference pattern is located on a screen three meters away, so that's L equals three meters. The distance between the second bright fringe and the central bright spot or antinode, so that's N equals two, is measured to be 1.1, so this is our x, 1.18 centimeters, which is 0 0.0118 meters. What is the wavelength? Well, the wavelength is xd over nl, but before we do anything, are we allowed to use this formula? I call this the shabby formula. It's garbage. It sometimes works. And in my mind, I hate something that I can't rely on. But there's a reason we use it. Okay? Can we use it? Well, we can only use it if the angle is less than about 10 degrees. And if you go back and take a look at our diagram here, we have a right angle triangle that relates the length L and the distance x to the angle. We can find the angle by using, this was 0 0.0118, yes? L was 3. We can do a tangent calculation. By the way, how many of you see that 3 meters is 300 centimeters? So if I, if I draw 300 centimeters as the base of this triangle and go up one point something, do you think that angle is going to be more than 10 degrees? I doubt it. But what we can do is actually calculate it. We can take tangent of theta equals opposite, which is, I'm going to write 1.18 centimeters over 300 centimeters. You could use meters if you like. It doesn't matter. So I go inverse 10 of 1.18 divided by 300. Making sure I'm in degrees, which I know I'm not. It's not even a degree. What does that tell us? We can use this formula. We're allowed to. 
So lambda will be 0 0.0118 times 2.6 times 10 to the negative 4 over 3 times 2. Getting 5.1 times 10 to the negative 7. Yes? Okay. I think it would be maybe unfair. That's 511 nanometers, by the way. Uh, I think it would maybe unfair to say what color is that. I know it's probably green because green light is about 535 nanometers. But I think that's maybe expecting too much of a student. Any questions with that example? Right. So in a double slit experiment, different colors of light are used to produce different interference patterns using two slits on a glass slide. So what does this mean? It means you shine the red laser light through the double slits. You make an observation. You repeat it with different colors. We always use L is 1.5 meters. And X is measured. And this is x for n equals 1. And it's a graphical analysis. When you plot the wavelength on the x-axis, which is the manipulated variable, and you plot the distance to the n equals 1 antinode, which is called x on the y-axis, you get that line. So this is, <laughs> this is awkward. We have lambda equals xd over nl. And we want to rearrange this for the y variable. But the y variable is x. You catch my drift here that this is y, even though it's called x. So I need to rearrange this equation for x. x will be equal to lambda n l over d. I'm going to write that up here. I'm going to write it instead as x equals n l over d times lambda. Can somebody explain why I wrote the equation the way I did on the graph, Evan? Right. I'm doing the y equals slope times x. And this, again, is confusing because I have two x's. But the x in the math equation means the horizontal variable. The x in the physics equation means the distance from the n equals 1 to the central maximum. What this means is the slope of our line is equal to nL over d. Somewhere on the diploma exam, you're going to have a graphical analysis question. You will. So at most opportunities, we do some in class. Do we know n? Well, n is 1. Do we know l? I, don't, I can't believe I forgot it. Was it 1.5? 1.5. Do we know the slope? Well, no, but we can find it. So once you know the slope, you can put all three of these into this equation and solve for d, which is what the question is asking us to find. Um, I'm going to take this point right here and I'll take this one here. My rise, it's up at 19, and it goes down to 9. My rise is 10 times 10 to the negative 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep. And that's in meters. My run goes from 4. This is that awkward scale of 
here's 6, 6 6.4, 6.8, 7.2, 7.6, 8. 4, 6, this is 8 here. Just want to make sure 5 squares is 2, yep. So it goes from 4 to 8, which is 8 times 10 to the negative 7. So we need to divide these two to get the slope. And I get 1.25 times 10 to the 5. Okay. So my slope is 1.25 times 10 to the 5. I can put all of those numbers in and have 1.25 times 10 to the 5 equals 1 times 1.5 over D. I want to say 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. Yes? Okay. So we get D equals 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. And that would be in meters. So I believe we were asked for two things here. We got the slope which would round to 1.3 times 10 to the 9, no, 10 to the 5. Yeah. And then the actual distance between the slits is um, the 1.2 times 10 to the negative 5. So it would be 1, 2, 5. Any questions with those two examples? Uh, I, I don't know why. I feel very off kilter today in this lesson. Are, are you guys okay with this so far? Okay, let's go through the last example. I don't. I still don't want to rush because I still I feel off on this. Um, let's go through the last example. Uh, we're not going to assign all the problems, so I'd rather do this right than rush through to give you more time. We used to actually do this experiment, and then I was told that we weren't allowed to do the experiment, and I asked why, and they said, well, because microwave radiation is dangerous, so we don't want you doing this in our school division. Um, Microwave radiation that we used on the microwave generators is no different than your cell phone microwave radiation. So, but I'm not allowed to do it. And what we would do is we would put the two microwave generators at the back of the room, say facing front. And they have a little tiny opening that the microwaves go through and the microwaves will spread out in circular paths out each of the two openings. And then I would stand at the front with a microwave detector that would squawk it would make this horrible screechy noise whenever it picked up microwave radiation. And I would point it towards the back. We would discover that when you stood directly across from the center of the two generators, it would squawk very loudly. And as you move this way, it would decrease in volume to nothing, and then it would increase again. And that would mean that when you reached a second peak here, that would be equivalent to the bright spot to the left of the center. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here. When you take a look at this situation, this is the n equals 0 maximum. This is the n equals 1 maximum. This is the n equals 2 maximum. They're telling you in this question that when you repeat this experiment, x is 23.8 centimeters when n is 2. So x equals 0 0.238 meters. We use n equals 2. And this, this is a great experiment. I really wish we could do it. But I did do it one time after that, and I got in trouble. So I don't want to. Okay? This is d. You can measure d. You just put the generators down, and you put a ruler down, and you measure the distance. It's really easy to measure. So d is 
0 0.15 meters. And L, you can see L is 70 centimeters, so 0 0.70 meters. And the question is, what's the wavelength of the microwaves? And it was also a great experiment because on the back of the generator, it says wavelength. It tells you what the wavelength is. So what would we do? Well, we would use lambda equals xd over nl. But can we? Are we allowed to get away with using this shabby formula? By the way, the other formula always works. So you could choose to use the other formula. Well, let's take a look at the diagram. We have, I think it's probably clear to most of you that the angle is going to be more than 10 degrees. We have 23.8 centimeters as the opposite side to the angle. And L is 70 centimeters, which means tangent of theta is equal to 23.8 over 70 inverse 10 of 23.8 divided by 70 gives 18.8 degrees. Here's the beautiful thing about this in my mind. This is telling you you can't use that formula. Let me write this down. Theta equals 18.8 degrees. It's telling us you cannot use this formula. This formula will not give you an accurate answer. And again, I'm not going to explain why we even consider it anyway. But the beautiful thing in my mind is that means you have to use this formula, which is great because we just found the angle. <laughs> so once you know the angle, why not use that formula anyway? That's kind of my philosophy. Um, was D 15 centimeters? Okay, so we're going to take 0.15. We're going to multiply by sine of our answer. And we have to divide by 2 because N is 2. And you get that many meters, so times 100 is 2.4 centimeters. <laughs> 